Great. Thank you so much for inviting me, Anna and Olivia. I'm always happy. PRC is one of my favorite conferences every year, and uh, I'm really happy to be involved. Uh, I always like to contrast uh, our disclaimer uh, with the one from the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, because at least they admit that they, they might be in agreement. We're, we're clearly not. Okay. All right. So these are two great papers. Charles, uh, Charles went second. Uh, we care a lot about Japan because they're the demographic ghost of Christmas future. We worry, is there some, something there we can learn from them? Uh, and then the Brown paper, this is a, a great paper in part because many of us who've spent lots of hours and weeks and uh, years uh, building models to try and project outcomes for populations, this is a shortcut and a really nice one uh, that allows you to connect what actually happens to people to an underlying set of characteristics with the panel data. So I'll start with Charles. Uh, so uh, basically the proportion of families with debt is up slightly. It's mostly 30 to 39 year olds. Uh, and some of that could be due to this home ownership policy change. Clearly the debt to income ratio is a lot higher and that does seem to be consistent with what the sorts of things, the premise for our being here. Uh, it, it's most noticeable for the young, it holds across cohorts. And that, that serviced income depends on interest rates and we were worried about that because of the shift of VRMs. But it draws our attention to the role of house prices. And I went back and, and found this, uh, this data from OECD. And, and the, the title for this should be something like, you think you had a housing boom. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but I think when we look at the timing of the sorts of phenomena that Charles was showing us, this graph has a lot to say. And, and part of this is it's not so much the demographic implications, but it's the macro prudential Im implications, the, the sort of debt, the hangover debt that, that was carried forward. We worry about that and sort of what it's doing to the macro economy. And, and so I guess the, uh, the good news is our, our housing market uh, is recovering somewhat as it is in most of the OECD. Uh, moving on to the second paper, uh, what Karen showed us again, we had this, this collection of hardship outcomes. Uh, to talk about. All of these measures are static except for the wealth drop, and I think that, that's, that's key to something I'll say. And again, this is just uh, uh, cutting to the chase, as she did. Uh, there is a projected increase in these hardship uh, measures for the 1952 to 57 cohort relative to their predecessors 20 years earlier. Uh, and then the key is that this is because of demographics, it's not because of, of economics, uh, which uh, it, it leaves you scratching your head a little bit in a few, uh, few areas. Uh, and I think uh, Karen alluded to some of that, but I have a few outstanding questions just to put the, these markers down. I think the, the first one is why do race and ethnicity matter the way that they do? Is it just because of this rewarding, that reweighting that they have higher wealth um, uh, higher lifetime incomes, or do they actually predict more hardship within these equations? So we have these predictive equations, your characteristics when you're in your 50s, uh, help predict your outcomes when you're in your 70s, and I know that race and ethnicity fit into those predictions, and if so, I'd really love to peel apart these mechanisms and understand them a little bit more, because uh, we really do think about, uh, think about these as economic phenomena. Uh, what are the differentials or differences in expected mortality? Is differential mortality built into the, uh, to the models? Uh, we would expect that might affect things, particularly over this age range. Uh, differential mortality is really important. Why does working longer not matter? This is one, uh, Karen raised it as a puzzle and I'll double down on that. Uh, it seems like one possibility is the way you're computing the social security wealth, if that's not aging forward. I think that working longer for a lot of people, uh, especially in the bottom half of the income distribution, that's their key to having a higher retirement income. And if the social security wealth measure doesn't capture that, if it's not moving endogenously, then uh, that could be uh, some of it. The other thing I'll point out that this, this wealth drop measure in a stochastic model, I would expect uh, there would be some wealth drop for some fraction of the population who experience certain types of shocks, uh, that, that, which is part of why we want to hold liquid wealth sometimes. So anyway, uh, two great papers. What I want to do is step back and try and put these into a broader context, talk about how and why death matter, uh, debt matters. Uh, debt is, uh, in a textbook life cycle model, we care about wealth and income. Debt is just the negative part of W, so it shouldn't matter anymore in a certain sense than the positive part of W. Uh, debt service is just a negative offset to Y. And so it seems like we could study well-being just focused on net worth and some measure of disposable income, which would be after interest, so after we subtract that interest. Uh, there's two complications to this, and this is the framework to, to embody this. And 
housing, I think, is very different from every other form of wealth. That was, if there had to be a theme for this morning's session, I think housing is going to be part of it. Um, and the various types of risk complicate the fungibility between wealth and income, and we'll, we'll touch on both of those. So housing is both wealth and a consumption flow. When you own a home, it means you require less income because there's no rent to pay. Uh, and owning is more certain. House prices don't matter. So it's a form, it's a type of an insurance policy. It's also emergency end-of-life wealth. This is, as we know, having equity in the house is often what pays for long-term care. Uh, it lessens the need to burden or rely on your children. And, and it has the added benefit that a house is transferred to children at death if it's untapped. And it suggests that a dollar of wealth is, uh, in housing is unlike a dollar of other wealth and helps explain why you have such inelastic demand for, uh, for housing. Um, the, uh, and this, this leads me in stepping back to think about what are the trends in home ownership and how can we fit that into, these, uh, into this overall framework, the overall uh, uh, you know, questions for this conference. And we can look uh, using survey of consumer finance data, uh, as of the, the group who's on the, uh, in retirement now, about 90% of them own their own home. And even in the bottom half of the permanent income distribution, about 80% of this group in the 1931 to 40 cohort, today's retirees, uh, are homeowners. But how is this changing? And so this is a chart similar to the one Mita showed you earlier, where every colored line takes a cohort and tracks them through the survey of consumer finances from 1989 to 2016. And the red arrows I highlight there are to show you how much the home ownership rate has dropped relative to the cohort ahead of them. So for these younger cohorts. Uh, so, and in particular, we see a really big drop at the young end of the age distribution for the 1981 to 90 cohort relative to the cohorts ahead of them, the 70s and 60s. As of age 30, their, their home ownership rate is almost 20 percentage points lower. So that's all families, and what, uh, what's really striking, if we go to the top half of the permanent income distribution, the story is all about young people, and that's what we were hearing earlier, young people with student loans, not, not becoming homeowners, uh, and, but once we get up into the older ages, now clearly the 1981 uh, uh, to 90 cohort, we don't know exactly what's going to happen to them, whether they're going to return to these life cycle patterns. Uh, there are some indications that they probably will. But the distressing news is here in the bottom half of the permanent income distribution. So again, every family here is sorted within their own birth cohort. So we're truly looking at the bottom half within those birth cohorts. And what we see is over the past eight to 10 years uh, that uh, home ownership has really veered off of these, these life cycle patterns. Uh, and systematically and through the age distribution, not just for the young people. It's obviously very dramatic for the young people, but they didn't have very high home ownership rates at young ages anyway. What we're really seeing is, for example, the 1960s cohort, the 1950s cohort, the 1970s cohort, very big drop offs in home ownership rates in the US. And this to me is something I think we should be, we should be very, very concerned about. And, and, and whenever I show these pictures, I always say, is this, is this just another marker of increasing inequality, lack of opportunity? Julia pointed out that very nice uh, Federal Reserve uh, note uh, that I, I recommend to everybody on, on wealth inequality and how home ownership is playing such an important role. Uh, home ownership and access to retirement accounts is playing such an important role in these widening wealth, uh, wealth inequalities. So, um, so I stepped back once to, to talk about housing. I'm going to take another step back and try and think about these, these issues and try and put it all together uh, in, in an even broader, broader context, which is to think about housing debt and think about intergenerational contracts. And if you think about there's two societies, one in which there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, where, there, where homes transfer at death, uh, and there's no explicit loans to young people who pay them off, versus one, the one that we're used to here in the US, where the old uh, provide the funds to build new housing, the young uh, live in that housing, pay off their bonds, and eventually become old owners. Uh, society A does have debts, it's just the debts are more implicit, obviously. You're, you're, it usually involves intergenerational living arrangements, um, and, and the evolution to living separately uh, is about having more explicit debts. It sort of goes hands in hand. And, and looking back to what Charles taught us about this, this evolution, what's happening in Japan, is that are they just becoming more type B? And is the US becoming more type A? 
uh, that in some sense what's happening is that, especially in the bottom half of the income distribution, you're having much more of this uh, of uh, co-residence that's happening. Uh, it's not just young people living with their parents, it's parents living with their middle-aged people. So uh, much more of this is, is happening. Uh, or or middle-aged renters who are much more uh, exposed to a shock, and this ties into uh, to Karen and Jason's paper, where uh, one other type of hardship I'd, lo I'd love to see you look at is, is having to move in with your kids. Um, when I was at CBO a long time ago, I uh, started working on social security policy. Bob Reischauer, who was uh, an amazing CBO director, uh, I, 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 I talked about how are we ever going to fix social security. It just seems like such a problem. He says, don't worry, we're going to fix it. Because if we don't fix it, the kids are going to have to live with their parents, and nobody wants that. Uh, so, and, and to some extent, he was right, but I think we're actually drifting away from that a little bit. It worries me. Anyway, stepping again, this, uh, this, this issue about wealth and income and thinking about hardship, thinking about well-being and retirement, um, you know, there, we, we often run into the annuitization puzzle. Why do people forego the risk-sharing benefits of annuitizing their wealth? And, and it could be that certain income streams are, versus liquid wealth are each appropriate for addressing different types of risk. You want both. Part of your income to be certain, part of it to be in a lump sum that can address certain types of risk. And the insurance coverage of those risks, and home ownership is a form of insurance. That's my, if there's a takeaway from this, I do believe that home ownership is a form of insurance is really key for fungibility. And in that sense, rather than focus on just debt uh, and as people are entering retirement, we should really, I think, step back and, and think more broadly about debt and, uh, as, uh, and, the, and housing, ho housing policy in a more general sense. And that's all I have. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, sir.